All right, I think we're ready to kick off. Good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Welcome to the third session of HK45's 2022 Fireside Chat Series. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Murphy Mock. I am a senior associate at Herbert Smith Freehills in Hong Kong and a member of the HK45 committee. For those new to the Fireside Chat series, it is a flagship initiative of the HK45 to showcase a wide range of leading arbitration practitioners. Our hope is to promote diversity in the arbitration community by inviting our speakers to share their career highlights, personal stories, and lessons learned. In case you're unfamiliar with HK45, we are a group for young or young at heart arbitration practitioners in Asia and globally. Our aim is to provide a platform for members to learn from each other and leading figures in arbitration. Membership is free and open to everyone. So if you have an interest in arbitration, wherever you may be, I would invite you to join. Given the global pandemic, we have been holding the fireside chats virtually instead of physically in recent years. But this has allowed us to spotlight speakers from all around the world, which has been a real privilege. Today, we are very pleased to have none other than Dr. Todd Weiler with us. Todd is a leading arbitration practitioner based in Ontario, Canada, with over two decades of experience serving as counsel, expert, and arbitrator in international investment disputes. Having handled some of the earliest NAFTA cases, Todd is a true pioneer in the development of international investment law and dispute settlement. He has acted for investors, governments, and non-governmental organizations, and handled disputes across many sectors, including environmental and climate change regulation, waste disposal, natural resources, transportation, and IT, just to name a few. Todd holds master's degrees in public policy, international trade law, and international investment law, as well as an SJD in public international law from the University of Michigan Law School. He is also responsible for a large body of academic work, including the acclaimed 2013 book, The Interpretation of International Investment Law, as well as 16 volumes on the doctrine and development of international investment law and practice. On top of that, Todd co-founded the University, sorry, the Society of International Economic Law and the Oxford University Press's investmentclaims.com. And since last year, he co-chairs the ICC Task Force on Disability Inclusion and International Arbitration. I'm also pleased to introduce the host of today's session, Eric Ng, the newly appointed Deputy Secretary General at the HKIAC and one of the co-chairs of the HK45 Committee. Prior to joining the HKIAC, Eric worked as a barrister at law in Hong Kong, focusing on international commercial and construction arbitrations and commercial litigation. Eric was also previously an adjunct professor at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing, lecturing in advocacy and investor state arbitration. Before I pass the floor to Eric, just a few housekeeping points. There is a Q&A function, so please feel free to share your questions. I would also mention that this session is being recorded. We'll be uploading the recording to HK45's website and LinkedIn page afterwards. So please feel free to share with others. On that note, I'll hand over to Eric. Thanks a lot, Murphy. And, and it's great to have you here, uh, Professor Weiler, um, joining us from um, late at night, actually, in, in the United Kingdom. So thank you again for giving us your time and, and, uh, and participating in this fireside chat. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and, and I hope you don't mind the hotel room bed behind me. <laughs> no, I think uh, with, with all the quarantine in Hong Kong, I think we're all used to, to seeing conferences from hotel rooms. Um, so I think we probably to start off, let's start from the beginning. And uh, I think from the beginning, you know, you didn't actually start off as a lawyer. I mean, your degree, I think, uh, from your CV is that you, your degree was in political science and public policy. I mean, and your first jobs were actually as a uh, tariff administrator and a policy analyst in Canada. So uh, just from the perspective of a, of a younger student who, you know, just in college, what drove you towards working in the public sector and, and, and for the government? 
Well, uh, you know, in a way, I think it, I was around age 10 when I decided I wanted to do something in the field of international law or economics. So I was pretty young. Um, I, me I remember I found this tape cassette. I'm not sure if a tape cassette will actually mean anything to anybody anymore, but I had a, a, a magnetic tape cassette and it, on it it said hostages free and Reagan inaugurated. And uh, that's that I would have been 12. So I, I must have had an interest at a pretty young age. Um, I always knew I wanted an academic sort of focus. Um, I did know that I wanted to go to law school um, midway through my, my bachelor's degree in political science. Uh, I did think though that I was, was gonna be an academic. So I also did a master's degree before I went to law school uh, at the same university. Um, as regards the jobs, well, uh, interestingly, I went to a university called the University of Waterloo, which is best known in, in Canada around the world for its computer science and math programs. And um, it's, it's tremendous co-op program. And they even ha back in the 80s had co-op programs for political science students, not very many of them, but a few select few. So it was actually as a political science student, I would work one semester at school and one semester in the Canadian government. As to why the Canadian government? Well, because I was a political science student. Where else are you gonna, where else are you gonna go? Um, as regards the, so that was the tariff administrator work. Uh, and that did feed my master's uh, thesis in political science. On, it was called lawyers values and civil servants values. So very much interested in decision-making and, and, and uh, whether how bounded rational decisions can be made differently depending on the profession. So um, when I went to law school, I, I had an okay first year, but not good enough to be considered for one of the prime slots as a, as a summer student at one of the big law firms in Toronto. Um, but from my government experience, I knew I could probably get a job um, just using the, the student program. And so I wrote to a, a, a group of people uh, using the government directory. And I just so happened to find a, a small group that was responsible for Canada's entire regulatory policy at the Treasury Board Secretariat. And they hired me. And uh, I ended up working for them both of my summers uh, between first and second and between second and third. And also in my third year, I also worked as a, as a long distance uh, public policy analyst for them. So that's how I got my government experience. Um, I articled, uh, art we, we have a, an apprenticeship in our in, in the Canadian system, um, the English Canadian system, the, the French Canadian does too, but it's slightly different. And the apprenticeship lasted for a year in Ontario. And um, I uh, worked for Ogilvy Renault in Ottawa, uh, which is now Norton Rose. And uh, that went fine, but I also wanted to, again, try to improve the academic stuff. So the year after I scheduled to do a federal court clerkship. And it was during my articles and my clerkship that I did a master's degree in international trade because I cared a lot about international trade at the time. Um, I also identified myself to a trade lawyer who was working on customs and, and dumping disputes, especially regarding softwood lumber, which is a famous one between Canada and the U.S. for fed lawyers for decades. And I ended up basically, I didn't do my rotations. I was supposed to be a corporate law lawyer for four months and then an insurance litigator for four months and a labor litigator, but I ended up basically just doing trade the whole time. Um, oddly enough, I didn't get hired back. Because uh, the, all the people, especially the lady who ran the labor group, I don't think she was very happy with me because I kept doing the other work for the trade for the trade lawyer on the side. So all of that uh, set me up um, after. I, so I needed to have a job. Um, I, we didn't have much money, so I needed to have a job while we while I did the bar admission course part, which is a four month course. And um, through some connections with the previous job and with my judge. I got a position as a trade policy officer in a brand new uh, unit uh, in the government's, uh, it's, it's a department called the Department of Canadian Heritage, which of course is necessary in Canada because um, we, we get overwhelmed with and prefer generally a US content. And so there's a Canadian heritage department to try to uh, make sure that Canadian uh, heritage uh, still comes out. And at the time, the big dispute that I worked on was the, uh, the tail end of the uh, periodicals dispute at the WTO, which was a, a, one of the early big cases. And, and it was interesting because the Canadians at this point were trying to come up with a way to get around the fact that they had lost at the WTO. And um, what they came up with was 
a measure which I, I actually told them because I was technically just becoming a lawyer uh, and knew a lot about trade law wouldn't work. Um, they had the idea that the NAFTA had this uh, quote unquote exception for, her for heritage and culture, but it wasn't an exception. It was a retaliation clause. And so the U.S. didn't bother going back to the WTO when Canada came up with another violative measure. They just said, OK, fine, we're going to uh, target the tariffs at the ministers in the ministers riding and, and a few other key areas and see how you like that. And of course, Canada uh, uh, capitulated. So anyway, um, it just so happened that one of the papers I wrote while I was an LLM student in that first trade LLM was about SD Myers. And I was writing on it, writing about it from the perspective of the failure of Canada's regulatory policy to stop the minister from basically putting a protectionist measure in place. Coincidentally, same minister. She was first environment and then she was culture. So it's the same minister that was responsible for both of these protectionist measures. Um, so because I did uh, that paper and published it in an administrative law journal, I came to the attention of a fellow named Barry Appleton, who was uh, starting to bring the very first NAFTA cases. And uh, coincidentally, uh, his girlfriend, uh, her cousin, was actually a good friend of mine. And so that's how I got to meet Barry. And um, I ended up working for, for or with him for about three years um, before I completely branched off on my own. So long story to get to where where he wanted, but that's how it happened. Well, I mean, that, I think that it, it brings us to the, to the issue of, you know, serendipity. And some people talk about being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, and, and a lot of people talk about skill and, and, and hard work. And sometimes there's a little factor of luck in, in there involved as well. For you, I think, do, do you chalk it up to, you know, that you, you were self-driven, that this was, you know, completely your, your own making? Or, you know, is, was, is there an element of luck? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's definitely, definitely an element. And it's not just an element of luck in terms of just so happen to be a friend of the girlfriend of the guy that was bringing the first cases. Um, it, it, or the luck of just so happening to write about a topic from an administrative law perspective that turned out to be the second NAFTA case. Um, th so that was luck. It was also lucky in the sense that um, investor arbitration was just starting. Now, there was sort of like... Um, and by that I mean the, the the practice end of it. There had been cases over the over the decades, just a trickle of them. Usually uh, they would be your standard expropriation cases. Uh, but these cases we were working on, while we did plead expropriation, they were actually kind of like a trade trade uh, slash investment variety. Right. So they had as much of a trade element as they did an investment element. And I credit Barry for having first realized that this that this investment chapter wasn't just about bonds and, and banking. Uh, indeed, there's another chapter that dealt with financial services. It was actually a, a much bigger thing. And um, so that really made it all work. Um, so the timing was important. What's funny is the same serendipity, or in this case, the inverse of it, prevented me from becoming an academic because I was too soon in a, in, a, in a field that didn't exist yet. And it was very hard to try to get a committee of law professors to want to hire me because they didn't know what the hell I was doing. It, it didn't make any sense. I was just telling someone today, actually, that my, my very first time I ever spoke, I wrote to a man named Joseph Weiler, no relation. Uh, a he's a famous WTO uh, and European, European um, Union uh, scholar. And I wrote and asked him if he wouldn't mind my coming to his class and giving a couple lectures. And he told me, with a name like yours, why not? <laughs> but, so I, that's sort of how it began. Um, it's... Did you but know? the thing is, I just never could get a job teaching. So I ended up having to practice. And I also, another factor, since I'm, you know, the disability end is important to mention. Another factor actually is, as someone at the time with undiagnosed attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but also probably with a, a fairly high IQ, it seems, um, the way that I ended up doing my work was by always having my plate so full that I couldn't stop working lest something fall off, which would cause great calamity, I felt. So I basically drove myself 
to pieces working. Uh, and, and also I had a, I always had an, an interest, uh, an early interest in electronics and in uh, electronic communications. I taught some early courses on the web and regulation. And so it was a natural for me to first start with the discussion groups and uh, to then move on to websites that uh, gave access to the NAFTA cases for the first time, because the, at the time the governments weren't even issuing them, but I had worked on them, so I was able to, to publish them. So, and then I guess the final element, so there's the work, work really, really hard, trying to be an academic. So both the, the, the websites and, which is like more of a commercial aspect, but all of the writing papers constantly, and again, doing another master's degree at this time at Michigan, um, all of this caused me, well, by the way, the reason I did the degree at Michigan was because I realized that all of my five degrees, I guess there were four at the time, all my four degrees at the time were from Canada. Yeah. And I wanted to be a professor. So I thought I better get some from Mi Michigan. The dollar at the time was like 67 cents to, to the American dollar. So I actually didn't move to the US, United States. I lived in Windsor, Ontario, which is across the river from Detroit. And I just commuted to to a uh, to the school for that year. But anyway, so that was another part of the drive to the, the academic part to try to get a job, which never panned out. The final piece is, I don't think I ever, and maybe it's the ADHD again, I don't think I ever realized limitations. So I was much more brash than I think I probably might have should have been or certainly would be now. Um, but I had no problem, let's say, uh, for example, my both of my first and second books, where I was the editor and also a co an author of a couple of chapters, um, in both of those cases, I didn't seem to realize that it was perhaps um, inappropriate or at least, uh, what's the word, uh, gutsy to contact uh, Jan Paulson and, and Emmanuel Gayard and, um, and Maurice Men uh, Mendelssohn and just ask them to contribute chapters. Yeah. The weird thing is they said yes. Well, I think that's, you know, that that comes, I think, also from the fact that, as you had mentioned, you know, investment law at the time was not a, you know, well-known or, or very popular field. And, and sort of that brings me to the next, you know, point, which is, you know, you were really uh, one of the, you, you, you mentioned it as a disadvantage in relation to not being able to be an academic because it was you were too soon in the field, which hadn't really, you know, developed yet. But on the flip side of that, you were, you were basically on the frontier. Um, you were on the, the forefront of these cases where, which were dealing with issues such as, you know, the definition of fair and equitable treatment, <clears throat> the, def the, the standards of treatment under NAFTA. Um, what was it like working on that where where basically you're working on on points of law or points of interpretation uh, of a treaty that you know even the FTC had 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 not yet you know concluded on and for you know definition of terms which you know may have last been used in the 1800s what was it like what, what was it like for you working basically in a field where you're you're building this law yeah what we did was we basically looked we look back largely to the U.S. Mexican Claims Commission because there were a few books uh, published about that. Uh, so there was like Feller uh, was one of them. Uh, Kent uh, Orchard was another one. There are a couple of um, well-known, Borchard, I'm sorry, um, Edwin Borchard. There were, uh, so there were some materials out there from, but they were from the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Um, and but we we used them because they did seem, and also the other Claims Commission cases. I remember there was a one about uh, other uh, more Central American cases, and then there was one on Venezuelan cases. And, um, and of course, each, in each of these scenarios, this is old gunboat diplomacy, where the Europeans and the Americans would basically send a ship uh, with a, with a, with a, a compromis uh, to, and say, sign this, we'll have it, we'll, we'll, we'll let you continue to exist if you if you go to arbitration. So that work, that previous work, we used a lot for, and then we also used the US American, the US Iranian Claims Tribunal to a certain extent, because it had a broader clause for, for expropriation, but we also used a little bit of material that came from that um, to basically try to inform what we thought in uh, fair and equitable treatment especially should mean. Uh, with respect to national treatment, we actually went to the, the GATT and WTO. Um, that's kind of, to me, that's quite funny because later on, uh, 10 years later, when I did my doctorate, I realized that that was completely wrong. 
that uh, there's just a completely different way to look at it, national treatment from an investment standpoint than from a trade standpoint. I also found out in later years, especially as the internet improved and, and search improved, that there's actually a whole lot more uh, that was written in various law journals. And indeed, it's interesting, around the 20s is when the first attempt at a multilateral investment treaty took place within the auspices of the, uh, uh, what's it called? The, um, before the UN, the, it's not gonna come to me. This is an ADHD thing when you can't pull something you know. League of League Nations. Nations. Yeah. It was a League of Nations scenario. And they actually also, not only did they try to negotiate a treaty which failed, they also tried to codify uh, the law of state responsibility, the substantive part, not the part that ended up getting codified later. So there was a lot, there was a lot of material, wealth of material that was even, that we didn't even know was available. But uh, that's basically what we did. And we were a tight shop. It was me, Ian Laird. Um, we were the big drivers. And there was another lawyer named Rajiv Sharma, but he ended up going into corporate law. Um, basically, the three of us, and plus Barry, um, to a certain extent, Barry preferred to make sure everything ran um, and then basically um, review our work. But to a large extent, I, in a way, it was it, Ian and I, I think, were the, the two horses that worked the hardest. Ian's now a, a partner at uh, Crowell Mooring in, in uh, Washington. So, um, and we've kept up. We actually are working on a case together now. So, but yeah, it was, a, we basically, and, and not to, I don't want to diminish Barry's role. Barry was, the, as I say, was the first one to see how this stuff could be used. Hmm. And uh, he was able to hire some people who could actually put in, way too much work uh, on on it um but we did and 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 i do remember i do for example when pope and talbot i remember him telling us that we will look back someday that that, that and see that this was a very important case he was right and so the, there was some idea i mean do, do, you, do you think there were do you think barry understood just how big it would get in terms of investment? No. I don't think so. He actually, um, I think he wanted to keep it tight, um, which is why he preferred not to have, have uh, stuff published because the way that lawyers learn how to do cases is by finding published cases. Yeah. So if you can keep them from getting a hold of those cases, they can't help, they can't compete. But no, eventually it became way much bigger for example, by the time that we 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 set we established the uh, Society of International Economic Law, um, there already was like a whole stream for investment. Whereas for the first ten years of my practice, um, I would go to like an economic law conference, but it was all trade, and I'd have to explain what I did. And for example, I'm sure that John Jackson, it was at least eight times that he would look at me and clearly had no recognition of who I was the previous visit times we had said hello. Because of, I don't think I was any, of any interest to him because I wasn't doing WTO work. Yeah. So Bob Hudick was much nicer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, let, let's talk about that for, for, for a moment. I mean, you, you've already mentioned Barry um, as, as someone who basically got you into the field. But you know, you've also previously mentioned that you you received a lot of mentorship from Martin Hunter, uh, the late Martin Hunter, the late uh, Thomas Valde, uh, and also David Hay QC. I mean, well, what did how did you get involved with them, and what sort of lessons did they sort of give you as, as sort of a mentor to to mentee relationship? Thomas was he, we had a similar he had a unique personality, but we did have similar traits. Um, he was an entrepreneur. He was an academic entrepreneur. I was just speaking with someone today about how it seemed natural that Aberdeen would become the center for um, energy and, and international law, but it ended up being Dundee because that's where Thomas was. And he drove it to make it successful. Um, and he was very good at uh, getting people together. And oftentimes as he as his stature grew, getting people to write stuff for him. Um, that he would then co-author with him. So his, I think I, I probably his hard work um, definitely rubbed off on me. Um, I think what's also, it's funny also, he, he had a habit of saying what he really thought. Uh, so he might've had a little ADHD too, that was undiagnosed. Um, and funny, I, I, you know, I think that most, if you ask most spouses of arbitration practitioners who were around at the time, they'll tell you that they never want their spouse to get up on and clear the eaves because that's how he passed, because he fell off a ladder. And so my wife is very eager never to have me get up on a ladder. 
it kind of uh, left a mark with us. Martin, um, I met through the Myers case, and um, he he's very he was very well known for, men, for mentoring a lot of people, and he he had he used to call him his Martins, um, his uh, clerks, because the first two or three were actually named Martin by coincidence. So they all got known, got to be known as his Martins. Um, and uh, that, so that he, he was just, um, he was the man I called actually when I was doing my first case as an arbitrator and I felt I really had to uh, dissent, which of course in the tradition of arbitration, you're not, you're not supposed to do. But he explained to me how I could do the dissent, um, basically keep it very uh, tight, very neat. Um, and, and that was very useful advice because if I'm not mistaken, I think my dissents quoted more often and more favorably than the majority in that case. So that's pretty good. With regard to David Haig, it's just because um, my, my, so I was married in 1992 and my first wife passed in 2005 and the, I met my, my current wife online and she lived, I lived in Ontario and she lived in Calgary. And so I moved to Calgary, and that's where David Haig was. So um, we got pretty close uh, as a result of just being interested in the same stuff. And uh, I actually ended up working with him on a case that we unfortunately didn't win um, against the Czech Republic. And uh, so we went and took that case as co-counsel to, to the Haig. And then he also, um, he took a lot of convincing, but I got him to actually also co-counsel with me on um, a case against the United States uh, on behalf of a bunch of Canadian cattlemen. And in that case, honestly, I really was trying to turn the NAFTA into a, an EU agreement. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I, I mean, I had a textual basis for it, but I mean, I didn't, you know, it, it, we didn't necessarily expect to win. Um, and, and I felt it was a victory just in that our clients ended up getting um, the first calls when the BSC uh, policies were removed and um, got a lot of meetings that they wouldn't have otherwise had. And uh, we also didn't have cost awarding against us. So that, that was a victory. And that was um, Karl Heinz Bachstegel was the uh, was the chairman of that tribunal. So I guess working on the early cases also allowed me to just meet some of the very important people in the field. And, and um, one in each of facets uh, of, uh, of your life, one as, a, as an academic, one as an arbitrator, and one as a counsel. So, you know. It, my greatest regret, by the way, is appointing David to a case I've never been able to bring, but I've always hoped to bring. And as a result, I've had to distance myself. No. It's a terrible regret. I should have never appointed him because <laughs> otherwise I could have had a closer relationship. But now we just only meet at conferences once in a while, and we always make sure someone else is there, even though the case hasn't actually gone forward yet, because Canadians are very tight about that kind of stuff. Absolutely, I'm sure there's. I'm sure there will there'll, there'll still be time. <laughs> um, I hope and we, we when we were talking about Martin, you talked about you know you, you're being in your first arbitration and having to dissent, um, and so I guess what my my next question would be is essentially. You know, you got your start as a counsel. You and you were a counsel and an academic. Once you started sitting down as an arbitrator, and especially I think this case where where you you realized that you you had to dissent, did that sort of change or influence how you started approaching cases as counsel? Because you're still, I mean, up until recently, still primarily a, a counsel, or vice versa. You know, the that counsel experience change how you viewed things as an arbitrator, did that maybe play a factor in, in you know, you suddenly realizing you need dissent or realizing just how you should approach things as an arbitrator? You know, it's funny. I think the answer is I don't think so. Um, the dissent was because it was really a matter of, of doctrine. And um, as someone who became almost became a full full historian, as well as someone who cared about the very much the history of the of, of the investment law and how it was interpreted, I just thought they were wrong, um, the, the the majority. And it was about MFN, and uh, uh, I had lots of material. I knew I was right. Um, of course, that doesn't really matter when two people think you're wrong. Um, but so it was really just a matter of, of getting the doctrine straight. Um, the only thing I would say that um, being more of an arbitrator and putting oneself as an arbitrator out has done is it's made me more reticent to engage in social media. 
I, I love making comments. I'm, I'm a, a politically, I'm a classical liberal, or even you might say a Hayekian. Uh, Friedrich Hayek was, is, is sort of like my academic hero. Um, he was a lawyer who became, of course, one of the world's leading economists in the 20th century. Um, wrote books like Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Um, he, great thinker. Um, so I have a pretty uh, laissez-faire um, and um, you might say small government approach when it comes to public policy, not necessarily in the field of investment, but rather just generally. Um, I probably, if I wasn't trying to, you know, focus on being an arbitrator, I might, I might um, make more comments about uh, various fields. But I, when I think about energy policy, I think I probably should just shouldn't say anything publicly because that's most likely where I might find myself as an arbitrator. So now I'd be restricted to just, uh, I had no problem criticizing Trump, um, as most people don't. Uh, or if the field is clearly not one that's ever going to involve investment or some sort of uh, dispute that I might work on, I'm, I feel more free to talk about that. But otherwise, I've become much more guarded. Um, when I was starting out, um, especially with uh, Thomas and I both had list serves, and he ended up hire, hiring me. Well, it, he didn't pay me anything, but I became one of the first moderators of OGIMED. Um, because he had he had joined my regulatory policy list serve and I joined his Ogeman uh, list serve, and um, that's sort of how another reason how we met I think actually was was through our list serves. Um, it's it, so I guess there, when I go back to your earlier question, it is a largely it's, it's it's there's a certain amount of serendipity, but it's also a matter of putting yourself out there. Um, the only thing that's I think difficult though is it's quite possible that the time for doing what I did is past. It might be that there's that the hard work and putting yourself out there is still there, but it might take a very different look than it, than it did for me. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a question. I think no one, I think will, would be looking at, at the exact identical scenario. I mean, in, in terms of finding the timing, it's a question of identifying the opportunities when they do come. Right. So, and making them, making them yourself. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention that Barry and I um, had a slightly strange relationship. Um, he used to say um, he would bring us in every Friday night and, and ask us if we thought we had what it took to be an international lawyer. And um, this was like only four months after I was hired. And it was beginning to be quite a strain. And so I actually went and signed up to do a doctorate at uh, Toronto. Um, I later didn't do it because I did the first first year and then said, this isn't going to work. I better go to Michigan. But anyway, I, I said to him when he asked me that one too many times that, no, I don't think I do. And so I quit. Um, but luckily, Ian Laird, the person I mentioned earlier, um, he had enough. Uh, he, he, he was smart because he basically got Barry and I to, to make peace. Um, so I ended up being a consultant. And even though I would go to work every day there and I didn't have any other clients for two years, um, I was a consultant. And as a consultant, that did allow me to have my hours slightly more to myself, but mostly it just allowed me, at least on paper or in theory, to get other clients. And eventually I did start working with other lawyers. So um, if, 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 but not for our, 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 our difficulties in, in finding a place to, to reach each other uh, on, a, on a, you know, a friendship basis or a collegial basis, maybe I wouldn't have done it. But I've always been basically outside of the system as, a, as an individual rather than um, working uh, with a big firm. But as a result, I actually have worked with a whole bunch of big firms, a whole bunch of lawyers, because I ended up either the cases might come to me directly from the internet or through a re or recommendation, in which case I would hold a beauty contest, or the law firms would come to me and ask, and ask me to come and consult on their cases. So I, my clients, I always said, weren't actually the clients. They were usually really the lawyers. So that query, did, can that still be, can that still happen? The problem is that generally lawyers have high opinions of themselves. And their model is also based on getting work and feeding it down. So it takes a really smart um, lawyer to realize when they could actually very much add, add uh, value to the case 
by bringing in an expert who can actually help their help educate their their associates and actually just give them a, a sounding board. So um, the smartest ones do that, but that's kind of easy for me to say because, of course, I'm saying the people who hire me are the smartest ones. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think you're you're really giving yourself enough credit for for helping us because you you recently, as, as Murphy had mentioned, you know, you've been an advocate for disability inclusion uh, by heading up this ICC task force, but you've also been running uh, the Juris conferences, which is which, as we understand, is where you get young practitioners to try and get them those opportunities for exposure. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. What, um, I mean, we, we've talked about your own um, you know, situation with, with ADHD. Is that sort of what drove you to take over um, the ICC task force? And, uh, and then let's also talk uh, a little bit about your own mentorship um, programs in, in terms of the Juris programs. What, what drives you to sort of um, you know, pass that knowledge on or pass those mm -hmm. opportunities on? There's a couple of things. The first is that there's a there's actually an ethical obligation on, on the part of anyone uh, who's been called to the bar of Ontario to to mentor and educate uh, young lawyers. And I actually ended up. Um, it was kind of interesting. My father had retired from high school teaching and became a criminal lawyer in a city about 100 kilometers from me, where I grew up. And um, uh, because my father uh, was available to do half of the work, I actually ended up. Going, having four articling students over the years myself. Um, now, I don't think that they that the law society would have been okay with them just doing international commercial international public international law slash arbitration because there's actually very little law of Canada law of Ontario there. But when you combine it with my father's old fashioned criminal law practice, it actually worked out well. We basically just uh, shared those students. And two of them actually uh, ended up um, getting doctorates in this field, and uh, they they both now live in um, in um, Netherlands, and and uh, were godparents to their kid, and uh, uh, very close to them still. Um, so it it was it just made sense. I actually kind of I even just mentor people, just. Um, <laughs> Even outside of the professional world, I, there's this young fellow. I, he's not that young anymore. He's probably 30. But I met him about 10 years ago, and he's he's my massage therapist. But I've actually shown him how to uh, think critically. When I first met him, he kept talking to me about Alex Jones and how great his show was and spouting conspiracy theories. He doesn't do that anymore. Instead, he's he's pushing his own uh, his own profession to find evidence based uh, techniques that actually work. So to me, that actually might even be the best example of mentoring, that I actually turned someone around and got them to think critically. Um, with regard to Juris, I mean, honestly, one of the benefits of having ADHD, but a, a pretty good brain, is that um, you can think pretty broadly and, and um, pretty quickly. And in that case, I was supposed to... Uh, I was asked to do the very first Juris Conference with somebody else who ended up being too busy and couldn't do it. And so that left me in charge of putting it together. And so without the other person having to, to you know, reconcile my ideas with, with him, I just went ahead and thought, well, you know, I hate, I hate speaking panels. I don't like it when people just present papers. I want them to talk about something. And then I thought, well, how can I make this even better? And the idea was you get eight young people in most cases, haven't ever written of something or, or been able to present it, um, they're going to be guaranteed to have it published. Because what I did was, I and I still do, is I transcribe a panel of more senior uh, uh, professionals who basically critique and discuss and debate uh, two papers um, a piece for each of the four panels. And we don't give the people who write them a choice. We tell them, you're going to take this side or that side, and it's usually binary. Um, and that usually they're a, little un they're a little uncomfortable with that, but they, once we tell them that everyone else has done it for the past 16 years, they feel a bit more comfortable. But um, in doing it that way, I thought not only did I end up producing a, a conference which has had staying power, uh, because people actually thought that it dealt with more, more meaty um, terms than just your usual sort of panel on FET. We've covered FET, but, the questions that I formulated were much more uh, precise and and really because of course they had to be binary because you needed uh, two sides to it. 
Um, and that really helped, uh, I think, not only did it help the students who, like, well, they weren't students, and usually they were actually either graduate students or young lawyers, but uh, I think it helped a lot of their careers. Um, and it certainly made a good product, which I guess ultimately is the whole point, to make a good product. Well, absolutely. I mean, and that's in, in, in addition, I think, also to uh, part of the success of the, of the Juris Conferences, I think, comes and stems from the fact that they're being by led, so, led by someone who themselves is, you know, a, a prolific writer. I mean, many of us who are, are counsel or who are, are working as lawyers are, are spending basically almost all of our, you know, our waking time uh, on the actual advocacy and the things in relation to, you know, casework and counsel work. But you, uh, you've somehow managed to find the balance and maybe it's due to lack of sleep. <laughs> I've slowed down though recently. I have a six-year-old who also is ADHD and, and is gifted. He's clearly gifted. He can do square roots and he's in kindergarten, um, but he's a handful. And um, that did make it possible for me to have to admit my first failure which was that I had started a PhD in history at the school where in the city where I lived. And I got all the way to everything but the dissertation when in the middle of the pandemic, I had more parental responsibilities and I had to accept that I might, maybe I can finish it in a few years, but I had to stop working on it. And working on that PhD for the previous four or five years uh, meant I didn't write as much because I was learning how to be an historian. Um, and I did that because of my perfectionism. I, I wanted to write a book on the history of international investment law, but I wanted it to be really good. And I realized that a lawyer writing about history in that way usually ends up being instrumentalist because we're digging for the stuff that's going to fit our doctrinal position. And I knew that that wasn't right, but I didn't really know how. And so by taking the PhD in history, I think I did really understand what it means to be an historian and, and to think differently about it. So, but anyway, I wasn't, so I, I made myself into an historian, but I didn't finish the doctorate yet. So I, therefore I don't have another book uh, to provide. So I, it turns out that your plate eventually can get too full when you add a kid to it. Oh, and a pandemic. And a pandemic, which yeah. let, let's, let's be fair, added a lot to everybody's plate um, yeah. uh, over, the, over the last couple of years. But I mean, I guess part of that is, you know, what what sort of came to your mind when once you realized that you know you, something had to go off your plate? Was, was was there a sense of regret? Was there a bit of what we call FOMO or fear of missing out because you, because you didn't complete the doctorate? I mean, uh, you know, a lot of the, we have a lot of lawyers. We have a lot of people who you know moving on and, and uh, are you know starting to get families um or are, are having kids and trying to balance work and life in in relation to that i mean what what was sort of the thoughts that came to that that you had to deal with well because i already have one doctor and i really can't be greedy to begin with so that, that was the first thing um the other thing is um as a 54 year old man and my wife is 50 the fact that we were actually able to have a child um through the miracle of in vitro fertilization um I've got no problem whatsoever uh, dropping it because my son is this amazing little creature and I'm thrilled to be able to mentor him um, and have guide him through um, this, especially since he's got this a, a, a non-typical uh, brain. So he, he and he's, he's already actually self-aware in terms of the fact that he, his brain doesn't work the same as everybody else's. And he very much needs help because boys, especially when they have ADHD, they tend to be um, socially less developed. Uh, that's the hardest part. And they have suffered from emotional dysregulation. In other words, they get angry really quickly. And uh, th th as soon as they get angry, you basically, you've lost them until they calm down. But he's actually already figured out how to uh, basically meditate to calm himself down sometimes. So I'm fascinated with the boy. And as a result, I could care less that I couldn't finish the doctorate. Also, I mean, as you've mentioned, I kind of have a record already. So, I mean, the thing right now that I'm really, you know, if I'm distressed about or worry about is, am I going to get enough work as an arbitrator? That's, well, that, that's really the big thing because I keep getting counsel work and there are so many people going into the arbitrator field. Absolutely. And, and I think it's it's good to hear from 
you know, a, a practitioner such as yourself that, you know, I mean, for, especially for younger practitioners, it's a question of where the next job is coming from. It, you know, it's, it's, I guess, a little bit comforting, comforting to know that, you know, we have, you know, even as more senior you get, you still have those concerns. I, mean, I think, by the way, that's why a lot of arbitrators take on too much work because uh, they grew up thinking, I better, t I better take this because I don't know if I'm going to have work. And sure enough, if you look at my 23-year career, there's been points where the work just dropped off. Yeah. And then there's been points where it just accelerated beyond what I could do. It, the thing basically that's for sure is it's not steady. Um, so I think that actually, you know, trains people, even the most senior arbitrators, to generally not want to ever say no. Well, I mean, we, we, we have, I guess the, the fortunate thing is, is that, you know, even though it may not have been foreseen when, when you were doing S.D. Myers in, in, in the 90s, investment arbitration has exploded. It is it has grown exponentially since the, since the 2000s. And in fact, we've even seen in recent years, perhaps the, the backlash against uh, investment arbitration. You've seen the states come out and say that, you know, definitions of terms have gotten distorted. You've seen, you know, the, the, ex, um, the, the expansion of treaties from what would, you know, 20, 30 years ago been about 15 pages long to now taking up entire uh, books. And, and there were a lot that were just eight pages long. Yeah, exactly. Uh, efforts by Working Group 3 you know, in, from Uncitral in, in order to reform investor state arbitration. Without putting you on yourself on the line and obviously putting yourself in a position, you know, um, you know, do you think the system needs reform? And, and if so, how much? Um, or do you well, think, think can be put back in the bottle? This is where my hat as historian and my hat as a political scientist, I think, really comes into play because when I look at this, I think that at no amount of uh, tinkering is actually going to satisfy. Uh, the people that ultimately these efforts were trying to satisfy, or at least nominally or putatively were trying to satisfy, they're not going to ever be satisfied because ideologically they're really opposed to the to, to this kind of uh, classical liberalism, which is at the root of bilateral investment treaties. Um, and I think a lot of the people, um, if you look at the people who are most engaged in an ancestral uh, working group three, uh, most of them either seem to have an ideological perspective, which is, let's say, much more statist than mine. Um, and a lot of them used to work for governments or still work for governments. So what a shock uh, that, you know, if you if you spend your life defending cases, um, it's, I mean, it's perfectly understandable that you, you know, especially if you lose any of them, that, you know, you might want to, you might make the leap uh, to assuming that, uh, number one, that reform in and of itself must be a good thing. And that um, the changes that you, that that one thinks is necessary um, to get where one personally thinks uh, the, the field should go, um, th those are leaps. And I think that the danger there's certainly a danger to, uh, of baby and bathwater uh, there. But the other thing I would say, though, um, again, is politically, it really doesn't matter what the lawyers do um, because. And, and again, also from a historical perspective, I think what we're going through and what we've gone through since the, the, the beginning of the 20th century is a, <clears throat> a rough pendulum swing between a statism and, and a more uh, a classically liberal approach. So, and, you, and you basically it seems to be modeled on, um, you can see it in, especially in multilateral investment uh, talks. And Uncentral group, Working Group 3 is, for example, that is a multilateral process. Um, the, other, the one that signaled the change where the pen, pendulum started going back from Washington consensus into where we are now, and it has swung way to the other side, um, was the, um, the Energy Charter. The Energy Charter worked, and then the multilateral agreement of invest, on investment just a couple years later with the OC, OECD didn't work. So it was in that time where if you look at the literature more broadly, you can see uh, even at that time, a very much a reaction. Um, and in many circles, of course, you say Washington consensus and there'll be people who really, you know, they might even spit, like they they've so much, you know, did not like that. And, and I don't, 
in no way do I doubt the sincerity of people who believe there should be a larger role uh, for the state in one field or another. Um, I have a different perspective. I think that it's more important to have uh, individual rights uh, protected, especially property rights. But um, I mean, that doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, the funny thing is when you look at, uh, when you look at international law more generally, um, there's always been an ill fit with classical liberalism and international economic law. Now, the folks who have a more dialectical or Marxian approach uh, can, I don't think can, can abide this idea, but the fact is that if you, if you look at the foundations of international law, they're extremely statist. They very much accommodated a commercial, a, a, a commercial sort of approach, a mercantile approach, um, they, and even greater statism. So international law in and of itself really is agnostic uh, as regards uh, where the pendulum should be swinging. But structurally, it's very much uh, easier to see the state take on a larger and larger role uh, given the nature of international law which of course is state driven. Now, what's funny is that the, the, the human rights lawyers uh, would be the first to clamor and say, that's, that's not, that's the old way. That's not the, you're talking about a positivist approach that, that should have expired many years ago. Um, and yet those same human rights lawyers really generally don't like investor state arbitration. Uh, it may be jealousy because they've, they've got much weaker mechanisms in some cases at least, um, as opposed to the, the seemingly stronger mechanism for investor state. But um, it, it, I think it's just fair to say that um, international law was always a, a state institution and remains a state institution. And if the states believe that uh, the, that the uh, current um, inventory of treaties has gone, is, is not appropriate for where they believe the, the, the state should be positioned and what rights should or shouldn't be uh, 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 given to the investors, then that's their call. And if they want to tighten it up, they're going to tighten it up. Uh, I think, as I say, I think the pendulum, the in, the, what I call the international economic zeitgeist has very much gone in that way anyway. And that could be, whether that's socialism or Trumpism, or it, I mean, it, it's all more state. Uh, it, or, or social welfareism, or just name it. Like it doesn't have to. Even this is where right and left is like completely disintegrated, because the question really should be liberalism versus statism, not not right versus left, because that that's actually lost its meaning for the most part. So yeah, it's um, I, I'm I'm worried, but I think that ultimately it's much bigger than whatever they do. And the best example of that would be what happened in Europe. Um, when we had the, the political flares uh, with the NAFTA and, and after the NAFTA, when, it, when the NAFTA started being used about 10 years after it was, it was started, um, it was nothing like it was in Europe. In Europe, you really saw some serious uh, political mobilization and it very much corresponded with the Green Movement and uh, the green movements, uh, the tension that has always had with nuclear energy, which of course is, is arguably one of the most greenest energy forms there is. But, um, and that, that's basically Vattenfall, uh, everything after Fukushima. Um, and the, the level of, um, uh, now the problem is of course, the folks who ideologically don't actually like investor arbitration with, tend to be pretty much also akin, akin with those who are most envir environmentally focused. Um, so as a result, the inf there was an information, um, what's the word, um, a feedback loop that uh, basically allowed, um, in Europe at least, to see a, a, a very strong political reaction. So not a surprise, I, I don't know if we ever can go back. Uh, if we can, it might be dec decades down the road. In terms of where, where, I think the fact that we still have investment treaties at this point is actually uh, uh, should be considered a gift to to the lawyers who practice the field, because th that pendulum has been it's been a strong swing. Yeah, and I think there's a lot long of, answer. Think, sorry, no, but I think that's exactly. I mean that that's what that's it's good to have you know that. Uh, just to close things off because uh, uh, we are sort of running out. Uh, we're we're coming to the end uh, of the of the time. Uh, 
you know, we do have a lot of lawyers and, and a lot of practitioners who are looking to get into this field, who are looking to sort of break in and break through, um, to try to enter what, you know, we, we sometimes uh, from the outside looking in is, is a very closed circle. Um, as someone who is in that circle and who was there at the beginning, are there any sort of final thoughts or, or tips or uh, ideas that you would give, you know, to the participants or, or to the attendees here on, you know, careers and, and what, how they should approach things? Maybe just some sort of final words on that. It's, it's funny, uh, coming from a middle class background, at not having gone to private schools or anything like that. Um, I actually have always kind of felt a little outside, uh, even though uh, I've worked my way inside from, through my work. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have a different background in terms of their socioeconomic background. Um, but I just, you know, ultimately though, people are people and if you get to work with them, then that, that stuff falls away anyway. But it is at the back of my mind sometimes. Um, I think that it's got, it's really a matter of, of scrapping. Um, like being scrappy uh, in terms of finding your, your opportunity. I think you'd have to be careful if you're about to start work at a new firm. And it's one thing to identify yourself to uh, a practitioner who might be doing that kind of thing uh, as being available. It's quite another to say, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Because when you're in the firm atmosphere, that's problematic because uh, you've got lots of time. You've got like, if you, especially in some systems where you don't even have to get a bachelor's degree first, I mean, you're young. Uh, so it's okay if, you know, you, you spend five years at a big firm and just learn how to practice litigation well. If you really want then, um, then go do an LLM and, and focus for that year on that kind of thing, uh, you know, like some sort of academic aspect of it. And um, then you can decide where you want to go from there. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with just trying to get a good litigation job with, with seasoned practitioners so that you understand the basics of how to litigate. Uh, and it doesn't even matter where or in what field, because once you get to international arbitration, you'll see comparatively what is and isn't. Uh, useful because it's, it is its own thing, but uh, it's it's tricky. You've got to basically think of it as a long game. It's not just I got to do this right away, or if I don't, I'll never get into it. it you have to just be honest with yourself and say, uh, I'm going to do this for five years. I'm going to try not to spend all my money that I make at the law firm, so I end up having to keep staying at the law firm for the next twenty years. Um, just realize that you are you're giving yourself a, a long-term apprenticeship and from there you can you can do whatever you think you, you want to do I think that's probably the best way to do it now and but it does also mean the other aspect you can do while you're doing all that especially is if you're going to get all that law firm money uh, from the from the salary spend a lot of it more than your law firm is willing to give you um, on getting yourself known in the field through participation in conferences and writing. And so if you can do that, then uh, you'll get there eventually, uh, even if it takes longer than you want, which is hard to tell uh, most A-type personality folks who are the type that usually end up at a big firm. Be patient. Well, patience, pay, uh, patience is something that we'll, we'll, I think everyone will probably eventually have to, have to learn regardless of, of their personality. Um, well, thank you so much for your time, Todd. Uh, I'll ask, I'll open it to the floor now. Um, if anybody has a question, we have a Q&A function. Uh, and you can also uh, type in the chat uh, any questions that you might have. So we'll just give it a few seconds for uh, any of those questions to come in. I but the first uh, question would be, how are you still awake? <laughs> well, thank you for, for that. Um, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, again, let me make sure to say thank you again for all your time, Todd. I know um, it's really late at night for you where you are, um, and we really appreciate the time that you've spent uh, to talk with us and to give sort of you know, your, your background and, and, and your views on this. Um, the next fireside chat that we are uh, we will be doing will be with uh, Judith Gill, um, and that will be uh, hosted by uh, Murphy, uh, who gave the introduction here. Uh, I don't see. Make any sure to send me the link. I'd like to see. I'd like to see Judith. Absolutely. I haven't seen her in quite a while. 
Um, I don't see any questions coming in, so I think we'll let you go uh, go off to bed, Todd. Uh, and again, thank you so much, and thanks uh, again for attending uh, this session of the HK45 Fireside Chat. Uh, hopefully, we will see you um, soon enough. <laughs> Take thanks. care. Good night. Good night. Or good morning. You know. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.